Darren Ranko on the other side of the screen is both a uh, citizen of the Penobscot Nation in Maine, uh, probably also an American citizen, and a researcher and lecturer. And we have here, first of all, welcome, Darren. I appreciate your being with me. Great to be here. And I have uh, Exhibit A, one of his academic articles. And in, in, a, in the beginning of an academic article, I don't know how many you read watching, but there is an abstract, which is kind of a distillation of it or a teaser or um, an advertisement for you to read the rest of it. Um, most of the time, the writers have to agree on that. Sometimes the publisher uh, gets involved and, and edits it. But I wonder, Darren, if you would like to uh, summarize your own abstract to the article, Traditional Lifeways and Storytelling, Tools for Adaption and Resilience to Ecosystem Change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that paper was written with um, a couple of other uh, Penobscot Nation uh, researcher colleagues and myself, as well as a partner of ours at the Northern Research Station for the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. And um, yeah, I guess the the abstract, if I were just to explain it to anyone off the street, was would be to we looked at uh, across our uh, the Wabanaki tribal nations here, um, which include the Penobscot, uh, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, uh, Mi'kmaq, uh, and Abenaki uh, tribal nations, which are on both sides of the border here, uh, U.S. and Canada. Um, we we wanted to understand how storytelling was create created a kind of uh, a form of uh, adaptation, but also ongoing cultural connection to environmental change. Um, part of part of the energy for the article was to sort of uh, articulate a vision that indigenous people have been experiencing climate change for some time, and that our cultures are quite resilient in sort of narrating and understanding these um, environmental changes. So it's to set up some of our other work, which is related to climate change more specifically. But to us, this was laying out this framework that that our story traditions um, are ways of kind of documenting and adapting to environmental change. Well, fair enough. And on the one hand, I would say, aren't we all uh, storytellers, the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, the uh, the poetry that we recite in bars, a bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon, and mm -hmm. so on. Country and Western songs are great short stories, very short stories. Um, and on the other hand, uh, they are really important. So I, I think you'd probably have two different uh, readers who would say, well, okay, what's new about storytelling? We all do that. And others who would say, oh, this is integral to our our uh, our culture and our history and our being how, how do you bridge those two yeah and i think i think it's about um an orientation towards place right so when we think about it in an indigenous context and here in uh what is now referred to as north america or turtle island um it's because of the longevity of of, of uh, us as indigenous people being in this place that our storytelling has a different valence in tracking these environmental changes in these places and i think it's just to draw attention to that and to uh, assure the kind of the forms of recognition that we we ask for as indigenous peoples to um you know kind of have uh, a recognition of our leadership and and when it comes to uh climate and environmental change and sort of the the value that we bring as as both storytellers and knowledge keepers in into this uh the specifics of this place in particular well let me give you an example of uh, my eyes being opened about storytelling and then ask you to give me yeah. an example back one, I'm I'm um, channeling an old schoolmate of mine, Wade Davis, uh, who's a well-known ethnobotanist and probably a lot of other things, and a conversation I had with a Chinese deputy minister uh, years ago, and I don't speak Chinese, so he was speaking kind of broken English and saying, you know, there are three tribes uh, near where I live, and one is called the people who uh, stayed home, the other is called the people who came down from the mountain, and the other is called the people who went away. And the people who went away live in, in little homes with sticks, and he was describing a teepee, of course, to a tee. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a boat, and he described a canoe, and they have songs and stories that say, in times of, pat, uh, of famine, uh, get in your boat and row and row and row and uh, keep rowing 
Uh, yep. You will think there's nothing there, but you will eventually uh, uh, reach an island and then keep rowing. And he said, that's how your indigenous people got to where you are and maybe <laughs> Wade Davis says that uh, in order to have a sense of place <clears throat> to, to row across the Pacific, uh, you have to be really good at looking at the stars. So that, that opened up my eyes to the val value of storytelling. What's a story you know of that, that was really important for the people telling it and listening to it? Yeah, you know, it's um, stories are, you know, multiple things, right? I mean, and, and you know, in the paper, of course, we, we kind of give context because, you know, stories uh, uh, often don't speak for themselves, right? So uh, we tried to, uh, part of our sort of social science there was uh, working with the people telling the stories is to sort of give them that proper context. Um, you know, one story that gets referenced in the article is a really important one, and, it, and it's a story of, of, a, of a kind of a monster um that that sucks up all this uh water and and is blocking the the channel of 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 um our our river here we, we imagine as a penobscot storyteller the penobscot river we live on the penobscot river um and it's and it's about this interconnection that we have to place in particular species and also how to deal with environmental threat right so in that story you know, it can be mobilized in any sort of um, context around how do we engage um, in a in a in a um, methodological, you know, in a kind of purposeful way at solving a problem of environment that is impacting us. So there's a kind of um, protocol uh, in in how people in that story deal with this monster, even figure out, figuring out there is a monster. So there's this whole process where we go and figure out. What's causing this? Like the the rivers are now down to a trickle, and the people are starting to really suffer. You know who who goes out and does that? How do we figure out that process? And how do we do our own, in a way, science to figure out the causes of something? And then in that story, of course, we appeal to uh, <clears throat> our truth teller, sort of um, uh, hero, a religious hero, Gluskab or Gluskabe, to help us solve that. Um, but it, it is um, ultimately a, a way of sort of addressing a problem, impacting us all, um, appealing to sort of an interconnection across different places and uh, um, engaging in some uh, creative frameworks of renewal to remove barriers and then recognizing that um, once you remove those barriers or solve problems, that the, the environment doesn't go back to the way it was, but it actually is a now a new environment. And then, you know, different story. So Gluskab kills the monster, but it represents in the story that once there's been an environmental degradation, even after it's changed, the 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 people and the species and, and our connections to them those also will change. So it requires a new sort of framework or, or story to kind of engage in that new changed environment. Well, let me uh, challenge you a bit on the concept of a close reading. Um, when I did uh, poetry and prose and drama in university, we felt that the, uh, the sum was greater than the individual parts added up together. Because if you took it all apart and said, you know, what does uh, John Donne mean by uh, as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go? Are they dying? Is their friend dying? Uh, what does Shakespeare mean uh, by uh, to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them? Uh, can you really vanquish your troubles? And, and, you know, on and on it goes, and you consume lots of coffee, and uh, for those who smoke, lots of cigarettes, and, and try to figure out what all this means. And, and then, you know, you find out that when Paul Simon wrote Mother and Child Reunion, it was really a, a, an item on a Chinese restaurant menu in Lower Manhattan. It was a, a, a chicken dish with uh, yep. eggs as well. I mean, it has no deeper meaning. Uh, sometimes uh, people just like the sound of the word, as Paul McCartney said, he liked the sound of the word suffragette in the, in the song Jet. And I was kind of disappointed that I, there wasn't some nugget of gold at the end of these, <laughs> sure. these things. 
So let's just challenge you and say, now, if, if you were doing this research uh, in the 60s, you might have said, oh, well, this is a metaphor or, or deeper meaning about black liberation or about women's liberation or about gay liberation. Today, yeah. it's environmental change. A hundred years ago, it might have been industrialization. Right. Are you reading into or laying on top of this story our current preoccupations? I think that's a, that's a really wonderful question. And, you know, uh, I'll say that I don't uh, appeal to any objective um, framework for my <laughs> the method uh, uh, and my work as as someone with a PhD in anthropology. I think um, the sources of our knowledge as as, as social scientists and, and anthropologists is um, is its its truthfulness is comes from an intersubjective reality more than an objective reality. So I I can know another culture because I have a culture, not because I am a blank, blank slate. Um, I think in terms of our methods to kind of uh, set us, you know, not become just reading stories like the structuralists did and take in decontextualizing what I think a lot of structuralist readings of sort of mythologies or, or is that we we appeal to a kind of, um, you know, an, an almost an ethno narrative approach to this, right, which is to say, how do the people telling these stories interpret them over some period of time? Um, and sort of what are the connections uh, as indigenous people, what connections are we making? And I think quite honestly, in terms of, uh, you know, th there are also the structural frameworks we refer to a little bit in the, in the, in that article and, and, and other pieces the, that give sort of a meaning to like, you know, different stories, are told at different times with different purposes, right? So uh, much like, um, you know, the Paul Simon reference, it's like, you know, a pop song is a particular, has a particular valence and has a particular kind of purpose to it that attaches to its medium. And so these stories that get re reframed and remobilized by indigenous peoples over multiple generations, right? Have shifting meanings, no doubt. Um, but in terms of its, what truth it's offering us, I think the best that we can do is give it and be very mindful of, you know, that purposeful, what the structural kind of like, what kind of story is it? Under what purpose is it told? And then how are the people themselves interpreting them? Well, and nice rebuttal. And maybe it is that the truth that is uh, beneath the stories uh, morphs and applies to new situations over time. And it's, uh, it's kind of the point of our article, too, right, which is that the stories are not fixed in, in the same way that you would right? the stories are relevant and have relevancy because they both are adaptable and reframe reframable, but maintain sort of some deep structural kind of kinds of truths to them because of um, the driving context. Yeah. And since I'm I worked my way through grad school as a journalist, I feel no uh, compunction to be uh, uh, consistent in in the uh, questioning. So the other side of the coin is apparently a question Robert Frost, uh, the great poet was asked, does this line in your poem mean thus and so? And the great poet paused and said, um, yeah, it probably does by now. Meaning, of course, <laughs> that the yeah. way the piece of art interacts with uh, humankind affects it. You learned something about fireflies and fishing and uh, the weather. Could you share that with me? Uh, you know that was that that piece was actually brought in <laughs> brought in with by one of the other authors. I'd be reluctant to to talk about that. I, I apologize. I, I just I don't feel like I'll get it right. Well, I, I can just read it. For you. It, <laughs> it turns out, uh, you know, it turns out that lay knowledge, there's a wonderful um, academic journal article, I think by Brian Wynn in the UK, May the Sheep Safely Graze, about I, farmers who I were, know it. Uh, yeah. you know, you know that article, isn't it a profound Yeah, yeah, no, work? That, that work um, was really, uh, when I was a grad student, I was, uh, I was influenced by some of that. Yes, exactly. I mean, that I, happens I, to be... My dissertation was about environmental risk. So I mean, isn't yeah. that wild? Because it, it turns out that they were bucking uh, nuclear British nuclear fuel scientists and Sutterfield nuclear fuel, so, and they knew their sheep <laughs> better sure. than the scientists did. And it's a wonderful, wonderful article. I that was one of the texts I had at, at Leicester sure. University in the UK, and I'm uh, I'm glad that it was part of uh, part of your studies as well. Um, 
all I'm saying is um, uh, you, uh, you, you and your colleagues document when you see the first lightning bug, it's time to get the first salmon. And after the first lightning storms, you pick the medicines. And of course, the weather would affect both, uh, both t forms of living things. Yeah. Um, moving right along, you have a second article. And remember, you're still under oath. Um, this uh, <laughs> article here, Science in Indigenous Homelands Addressing Power and Justice in Sustainability Science from Within the Penobscot River. Uh, you have a lot of other, I think you, you co-wrote this with almost every other academic in Maine. It's a good long <laughs> list of, of co-authors. But would, would you consider um, uh, summarizing your abstract there? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And this is um, this is very much an article that, that talks about our methods uh, in terms of working cross-culturally with different kinds of science or, or knowledge traditions. And um, um, we go through a, a series of projects that we've done and, 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 and reflect upon sort of like the best practices to work in collaboration across sort of indigenous and non-indigenous scientists, recognizing the sort of importance of uh, indigenous homelands uh, th through through all of our work in terms of our relationships and, and how to do, um, you know, more engaged and better science in, in that context. Well, and, and good work and a good um, uh, approach. And to go back to Brian Wynn, uh, he said that farmers would often say they have a field that is higher than their other field, when in fact it was topographically lower, but what they meant by higher was a whole series of qualities such as the drying time, the ability to get your tractor onto the field, the yeah. harvest, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be open to terminology that isn't uh, perhaps in a science dictionary. Now, it, it is said, um, I'm, I'm, would you like two academic jokes just before we proceed? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, no, I love academic jokes. Well, there, there were two anthropologists, of which you are one, walking down the street and one said, you're fine, how am I? They bumped into a pollster and said uh, 19 times out of 20 within four percentage points, how are we doing? <laughs> the second uh, quip, not quite a yep. joke, is that um, an academic would rather use another academic's toothbrush rather than his or her jargon. So with that, uh, what is it you mean by sustainability science? Because I know what science is, and I think I know what sustainability is, but are we in danger of having Newton's second law uh, uh, unsustainable, uh, not uh, not not continue to function in the twenty first century? Fair, fair enough. Um, well, as you know, the this was published in the journal called Sustainable Sustainability Science. Um, you know, it's what we picked up on as sustainability science and one of my academic appointments here is at the George Mitchell Center for Sustainable Sustainable Solutions um for us what what we were picking up on in sustainability science which has developed in these last 25 to 30 years basically a, a an approach in um large scientific projects to try to answer the you know these fundamentals of how does a human society continue on with sort of you know social, economic, and ecological function? How are they all sustainable together? the The practice of sustainability science has has, has tried to establish itself as solving real world problems um, with multiple you know multiple with, with multiple disciplines. You know, kind of addressing um, problems that require different kinds of knowledge coming together that meet sort of an objective or, or kind of a, a societal problem. So where we picked up on that in an indigenous context was to see that actually that approach to kind of an engagement of, of, of scientific practice, you know, dealing with complex problems like, you know, how do you deal with an invasive species when, um, you know, it's coming, it's already here. Like, what do we do in terms of a cultural practice that would be impacted in that space? That requires multiple kind of formulations of knowledge and knowledge systems together. And for us, what the driving question is, how do you do that in a way that still centers indigenous decision making, um, orients, you know, power um, uh, or, or, or reformulates power towards indigenous um, systems of knowledge and indigenous people? You know, the, mm -hmm. in the classic one in, in that article was, 
you know, with that invasive species, um, it's killing trees that we as indigenous people uh, here in what is now Maine, we care about more than anyone else. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't a whole series of other forestry and other powerful interests that would dictate decisions around how to respond to that invasive species that would create much more significant harm to us as indigenous people in terms of our cultural practice. So we were trying to figure out how do we do a research project that would influence um, decision making and, and knowledge production around how to respond to that invasive. Um, and I think we were, you know, I think in most things that we refer to in that article, we were, um, you know, sort of successful <laughs> and and shifted the needle a little bit uh, towards towards our goals, which was to really recognize and empower indigenous. Well, people. could there be a, a greater yardstick of success than being on my YouTube channel? I I can't um, <laughs> I can't Obviously, imagine. Yeah, so try, I'll put that in the in the outputs there. Uh, but by the way, there's another uh, discipline that I think dovetails a bit with with what. Um, you know, you're driving at here, and I grant you, your first comment was probably among the most telling. It was a journal c called Sustainability, so you use that term, fair enough. Uh, but there is a new field called Consequentialist Epidemiology, which means do these studies that uh, distill things into parts per quadrillion and, uh, you know, decimal points of the population, do they have any impact on real people in real life? Is there a consequence to them? And I think that's a very um, a, a very novel and uh, welcome strain of thought in, a, in academic communities. And I, I do mean to uh, inject a bit of humor in that. Now, you use another term um, that I want to call you on, and that is centering. You want a lot of stuff centered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe the center cannot hold, as WB Yates said, but you want to center indigenous knowledge, um, uh, and uh, centering uh, numerous things in here. I'm trying to find a second one so that yeah. people don't think you only used one. But I mean, if that means putting indigenous knowledge at the center of this piece of research, one of my questions is why not use those articles and descriptive terms instead of the word centering as uh, sort of a verbal and, and, and let us guess what that might mean. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, and fair criticism, I, I think uh, we, may, we might have had similar responses from reviewers for this article, um, as I recall. I I think we do try to explain what we mean when we label, when we, you know, talk, use that term. Um, and I think um, we also recognize that um, so much of this work um you know we don't know you know i think that the the, the dynamics of power um as it relates to things like um in a room you know when when different people who have different knowledge systems come together to discuss a problem and you know map out a solution to that problem uh i think we are challenged you know by the ways in which power gets brought into that you know it's kind of like um, we often talk about in decision making, like oh, everyone needs to be have a seat at the table, you know. And I, I like that. Uh, you know, that appeals to my uh, sort of broadly democratic interests and in things. Um, but people don't bring, don't go to that seat at the table with the same, you know, forms of authority recognized in, in across generations or across different contexts. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, we talked about even in that piece and in and, and, and I think we're gonna try to write another piece of sort of where the sort of power plays and in, and in, in uh different contexts would be, you know, we do a lot of meetings in, you know, square rooms like this, but the shifting power narratives around whose knowledge really matters in a particular situation often happens out right next to that tree. You know, if you can tell me what's going on with that tree and where the invasive species, you know, might be <laughs> in relation to that tree and what its impact is going to be. Um, I think that's where, um, you know, power, uh, especially for indigenous knowledge holders, can happen um, in that interconnection of the place of that tree where it's located and that sort of um, sort of interrelationships of knowledge, which become, 
so important to solving these kind of complex problems where we are really thinking about indigenous knowledge in terms of its leadership. I'll say not centering leadership uh, in, in this thing. I, I'm smiling because if you can't guess that I was in uh, uh, high school as a young teenager in the late 60s in Vancouver with mm -hmm. Greenpeace emerging at the time, sure. and then later at U university, a little uh, little beside you at uh, UNB in Fredericton, we did a lot of going out to trees and talking under the trees about issues that had Absolutely. nothing to do with trees. And so um, I, I, I recognize that. And I also recognize that some people want to stand at the table or want to sit on the floor beside the table and have other ways, <laughs> just like Brian Wynn talked about other ways of doing things. Um, let me, um, um, now that we've um, made the center bulge, um, uh, let me deal with the word praxis. My understanding of praxis was um, an, an ethnographic tradition or participant observer tradition where the researcher would become involved uh, and an advocate for the topic and praxis was the most protracted version of that, just to give you another multi-syllable yep. word, and it yep. was um, mainly engaged in by um, South American uh, priests. Um, is that what you mean by praxis here in this article? No, I, I think it, it, this comes in a from a different tr tradition. The the I think the praxis we're we're talking about uh, comes from these you know the more uh, um, Foucauldian you know uh, post structural kind of uh, you know like an embedded structure of something that is not articulated um, often, and so for us. Um, and and then the other the my co my co lead author is a communications person, and she brings in a lot of that um, framework of of praxis as a sort of self conscious um, recognition of embedded practice, and and in order to shift it um, is to unveil it you know, so that post-structural move to unfail the underlying logics and then embed it, you know, and in, in embody a new uh, formulation oriented towards some other goal. You know, I, I was happier when I didn't understand what you uh, meant by praxis, because it <laughs> did seem to be an advocacy uh, angle yeah. to doing uh, research. Um, but um, your appropriation of that of that uh, term is fine with me. Let, let me let me challenge another thing because this is kind of fun and you're and you are um, at least receptive. You talk about um, the knowledge base of people, and if you're a decision maker, maybe that's an unfair advantage that you have. And and if you get to define what knowledge is, maybe that's unfair. And this is a Foucaultian thing. Foucault said. You know that that which is imposed from the top down shall be opposed from the bottom uh, up. Okay, fair enough. But how do you reconcile that with the status of knowledge keepers and elders within uh, the indigenous community? Are you equally exercised about their authority and their knowledge? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I, I would say that those systems are, um, are are quite different, right, in terms of the the ways in which uh, elders perceive and and exercise um and i don't think um you know I, they they use frameworks of caretaking you know not not control or or um you know m most of the elders um i work with d do not consider themselves experts but uh, uh learners right and so i think it's um they embody and try to bring people into a um set of uh relationships and responsibilities you know that sort of framework versus a kind of rights and dominion over right uh, things even though we articulate indigenous peoples in the context of rights our our political our traditional political uh, and knowledge systems um are 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 defined much more by relationship and responsibility than they are uh rights per se so i think um i would say then the goal is to embody some of that um set of frameworks that which are immediately more um inclusive than you know assuming a direct uh, set of um um 
decision making frameworks because someone has a PhD or has a particular role in government. Therefore, they get to define what what counts as knowledge in a, in a particular. Well, place. that would be a logical fallacy wherever you found it um, or yeah. credibility enhancement yeah. or whatever, you know, sure. some other good term. So really, in effect, it is not that there is a knowledge keeper, elder decision maker, someone who is uh, centered as the, uh, the person who judges the authority. It's it's how they got there or what they do with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the action, uh, the caretaking and responsibility action pieces of this, and this is embedded in so many indigenous languages compared to, uh, say, English, you know, where where, um, you know, in having a, a verb centered language, you know, the knowing uh, itself creates a said uh, a sense of a, an obligation of responsibility to to knowing that thing. So to know about in our teaching, say, around sweetgrass, um, you know, if you know about sweetgrass, you're kind of commanded in our knowledge to caretaking for it. And the caretaking responsibility is you take care of it, it takes care of you. So it becomes its own kind of circle, uh, exchange of knowing, doing, and uh, and that actually uh, as, as, a, as a practice um, for that species, um, picking it yearly um, with a sense of responsibility creates more sweet grass the next year, right? Mm -hmm. It's when people no longer have access to pick it or or don't pick it anymore. That's actually when the the when the the that species starts to decline and can eventually disappear. Well, let's uh, let's leave, uh, leave on a on a really positive note. I love the phrase "learning to learn" in your paper, and I. I, I tried to stump you on an academic article. Let's see if this one works because the last one didn't. Uh, you knew of Brian Wynn. Um, there's a BC uh, Superior Court judge, uh, his last name is Finch, I believe, and he did an article called The uh, Duty to Learn. And, and he frankly said, and it was wonderful, um, we judges ha are not historians, we're not linguists, we're not anthropologists, we have no particular training in trying to understand uh, oral traditions or uh, indigenous uh, uh, history, language, culture, law, and obviously there were laws. And he said, and we have a, a duty to learn. Wonderful. And now in that province, 10, 12 years after his writing, yep. lawyers do have to take uh, some, some upgraded uh, education on indigenous matters. Um, what's learning? To, were you familiar with that phrase, duty to learn? No, no, but oh, it it makes great. sense. I mean, I'm familiar with, of course, all the <laughs> the the fact that they are learning in that regard out out in uh, Western Canada in terms of the judges and the decision making out there for sure. So, how do you learn to learn? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that, and I thought about this too because, um, you know, we have in in this work where there's a it's a mix of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and I always think like, you know, oftentimes. You know, I entered the, into this space as an indigenous researcher trying to work on problems that my people from my community care about and, and you know, to orient research that benefits us and not uh, the academy exactly. Um, and I, all, I often think about it as tied to how people see them, first and foremost, to a scholar's identity. You know, some people we've, we've reached out to and we'll say it's the invasive species issue again. Like, you know, a forester who who knows a lot about how invasive species spread across a forest or, you know, these different kinds of borers or whatever. Um, and we'll bring them into conversation and they see themselves first and so foremost as an expert. How do you how do you learn to learn? And, and you know, we've vetted uh, a lot of folks, um, worked with a lot of different uh, researchers and you know, I think the people who see themselves as experts don't do real well in 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 the first and foremost in their identity. They're all experts, of course, um, but people who are really searching for um, think of themselves as lifelong learners are open to a process wherein you know different forms of knowledge can come together and create something sort of bigger than than its individual parts, right? And I think that kind of you know, that's that's what um, the National Science Foundation calls convergence thinking. Um, and I think that many in, uh, many of our indigenous partners have, because of a legacies of colonization, have been taught, you know, Western models of science and also 
taught indigenous teachings of, of sort of knowledge frameworks, and they're able to kind of bring together different um, frameworks of knowing. And you know, the the Mi'kmaq have have you know have their their uh, two-eyed seeing approaches. I think that that's a very much you know kind of in in indigenous knowledge uh, knowledge relationships. And I think for me, it's uh, I, I've been we've had great partners, non-indigenous partners who uh, are scholars who no longer have anything left to prove. You know, they're full professors, they have all the grants and publications and they're like, I wanna learn something new, you know? And those people who have sort of that wealth of experience and knowledge and yet see themselves as a learner, I mean, you could call that wisdom. I'm not sure what you call it, but I think those are the people that are sort of open to learning to learn, you know? And I, when I think about, you know, engaging in a process where it's a collective effort of uh, first and foremost, different knowledge is coming together. So that's well, I... and and triangulation, convergence, uh, or open-mindedness. You know, could be the the phrase. Um, I began um, a university essay with a quote from my wife and her lifelong friend, who was a distinguished radiologist uh, and physician, and the paper began thusly: Did your feet? grow a size after pregnancy mm -hmm. woman number two there's nothing in the literature about that <laughs> so right. you know yeah. uh, maybe it happens all the time in real sure. life but maybe male editors of academic journals or medical journals or sure. simply maybe medical journals are not really interested in women's feet uh, so that is um, another case for open-mindedness uh, Professor Doctor, I wonder if you have any words or phrases in Penobscot you'd like to share with us. Um, I would say just Kachiwaliwan, uh, you know, it's uh, many thanks to um, you engaging me. This has been really, uh, really thought provoking and a different angle on things. So I'll, I'll just say I'll just say that I really appreciate uh, the time with you. Well, that's very kind, and that is the one of the very few vocabulary words that I know. Uh, it's uh, thank you, and they, they are pronounced a little differently, just like yeah. in in yeah, uh, Maine. Right. My my stepmother is from um, a place in New Hampshire called Concord, mm -hmm. which in Canada is pronounced Concord. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, that may be a plane and not elsewhere. Um, look, thank you very much for your time. The articles um, I enjoyed, I recommend them to people, and they are a benefit and I appreciate it. Thank you.